So these uh, these slides. I don't know. Sometimes we do stuff interactive, but I I think it's probably more useful for me to just talk. In this. But it, I may ask for audience participation sometimes. So we'll see. Retina layers. Um, I feel like it's not high yield for me to go over this at all. So no. But the, there they are. Um, I have. I've made a couple little mnemonics, but I feel like those don't always help either when people say them to you. But um, like for the uh, like inner interplex form layer, like you can kind of remember it's in, and for the inner nuclear layer, in the bag, B-A-G, it has like bipolar amacrine and ganglion cells, and then I think also horizontal cells in the, um, in the inner plexiform. And if you can remember what's in the inner, then you don't have to remember what's in the outer because they, and the only one that they share between the two of them are the bipolar, bipolar cells and bi make, in that case makes sense. It's like they're in both, so I don't know. You just, the, so many of these questions come up on OCAPs and uh, on opto questions that you have to find some way to remember it if you can't just remember little tiny cell layers like me. So, um, and the, Photoreceptor cycle is just something you're going to have to memorize, and it doesn't help for us to go over here. You just have to read it enough times to see that. So. Um, but histology sections of the retina are definitely high yield, um, and that's a little out of the scope of, mine, of my presentation. Hopefully you get it in your path presentation, the way that different, cause I would say every single year, two or three questions that is just retinal histology. And so I would study it, I would try and look at some common diseases. Um, they like to show diabetic retinas um, on OCAPs. If you ever have no idea what something is, it's a, probably a safer bet to go with something more common like diabetic, diabetic retina. Um, and sometimes they'll pair a diabetic looking uh, changes with an iris, and so they'll either show you neovascularization or the, of the iris, they may show you lacy vacualization of the iris. Those are things I've seen pop up on OCAPs over the years for sure. Lacy vacualization is where you have um, kind of uh, like these lacy, almost cystic changes of the pigmented iris. Um, I don't have a picture of it, but you guys can look at that. Okay, so the phacomatoses always show up and it's always something obscure. It's never gonna be like Lish nodules with NF1. It's always going to be something completely random. I can't necessarily point to it because every year I feel like it's been a different one. But one thing that is high yield is knowing the different names of the different syndromes because you can be totally thrown about what they're talking about. Anyone know what Bourneville syndrome is? It's one of the common ones, just another name for it. <coughs> it's tuber sclerosis. So they can throw out Bourneville syndrome as one of the options on your test. Um, and there's a classic triad of the uh, adenoma sebaceum, mental retardation, and seizures. Um, and they get astrocytic hematomas of the retina, optic disc and brain, periungual fibromas, cafe au lait spot, chagrin patches, and the ash leaf spot. I've seen, at least on opto questions, they like to show um, that. Oh, no, I didn't listen today. I'm sorry. That was a fail. Uh, I wanted to get the laser pointer, and apparently this is smarter than me. Okay, they'll show you a picture of a face with those very characteristic changes. So, um, and then these are some histology. I don't think I've ever seen histology of tuberous sclerosis on one of the tests, but um, that doesn't mean it can't show up. Um, and this is showing uh, the astrocytic hematoma. And this is the adenoma sebaceum of the face. I don't think they would show you this path, but they could, so. Um, von Recklinghausen disease is the other name for NF1. Um, I think there's 17 letters in von Recklinghausen disease, and it's on chromosome 17. That's usually how people remember it. Um, there's criteria for diagnosis of the disease. I don't think it's high yield to memorize all of the criteria. Um, I think they'll 
you just should be able to put it together if they if they set you a patient that has some of these features. Um, cafe OA spots, axillary fre freckling, nodular neurofibromas, plexiform neurofibroma, and S shape of the eyelid. You can see that plexiform neurofibroma up there. Um, CNS gliomas, optic nerve gliomas are common, um, and they get fusiform enlargement of the optic nerve sheath. Meningiomas are less common, uh, and absence of the sphenoid wing with pulsatile proptosis. Um, that's high yield. I've seen that show up before as well. They get Lisch nodules. Um, does anyone remember how to differentiate Lisch nodules between uh, brush field spots and iris mammalations? So iris mammalations are seen, they're like the same color as the iris. Um, brush field spots are seen in Down syndrome and I, they are hypopigmented and Lisch nodules are hyperpigmented, I believe. Um, you have to double check me on that. There's a coloration. Basically, you'll usually not be asked to differentiate between something in Down syndrome. You'll be asked to figure out whether it's iris mammalations or one or the other. So just know the iris mammalations are the same color as the iris. Um, congenital glaucoma, usually uh, it's unilateral and it's where the plexiform neurofibroma is. And they also get astrocytic hamartomas like intuber sclerosis, acoustic schwannomas, and they also suffer from pheo and Wilms tumor. And pheo makes its appearance in multiple of these diseases. Um, and I have seen PATH on neurofibromatosis, um, so I would you know, make sure to review that in your PATH as well. I would not be the person to do that for you, though. And here are the... Yeah, so the, the uh, Lisch nodules. So you can see they're, these are hyperpigmented. So that can be a clue if you can remember it as to what you're looking at and help identify the case. Um, and NF2, NF2 has another name also. Um, and I can't remember it right now. It's, it's kind of descriptive. It's like multiple uh, schwannoma, um, there's another, it's a very long name. Um, I, didn't, I didn't put it in here, but I don't, I can't remember it, but sorry. But um, look up the other name that they can throw out for NF2. Um, they get bilateral acoustic neuromas, um, chromosome 22, it's easy to remember because there's a two in the name. Um, and they get PSC cataracts, and Lisch nodules are uncommon. So the thing to remember about uh, NF2 is that they get PSC cataracts. Um, and they get combined hematoma as well. Um, it's typically, uh, it can be duxtapapillary or peripheral. Um, and it's kind of an elevated gray ridge of tissue in both of them. Um, and let's see. Uh, combined retinal and retinal pigment epithelial hematoma is the same thing. It involves all layers and ERMs over them are frequent and they can be visually uh, very significant. They can also um, develop neovascularization. Um, that's what a typical um, hematoma looks like. And there's a picture of it on FA. And again. Okay, retinal angiomatosis is another name for von Hippel-Lindau. Chromosome three, it's autosomal dominant. You can remember it. Three von Hippel-Linda has three words. So, eye findings: retinal capillary hemangioma. Um, there's a, a feeder and drainage vessel, and they definitely can get serous exudations. Um, they get cerebellar hemangiomas, also in the brainstem and spinal cord. They don't get mental retardation. Um, they have association with pheo and renal cell. Um, the most common cause of death in these patients is, uh, is rupture of these hemangiomas and renal cell carcinoma. Um, treatment with laser and cryo. Um, and here are some path photos and other clinical photos of the um, capillary hemangioma. Um, and then this is a nice also clinical photo of the same. Um, encephalofacial angiomatosis 
is uh, the other name for Sturge Weber syndrome, and it's sporadic. Um, they get choroidal hemangioma, typically the diffuse pattern, and it's classically the tomato ketchup fundus. Um, they get glaucoma in 50%. Uh, the um, OCAPS likes this, uh, or not OCAPS, but Optical Questions likes the question if they have a, uh, a like a newborn with Sturge Weber and glaucoma. It's um, the mechanism of the glaucoma is most similar to congenital glaucoma, and if it's uh, a teenager or young adult with glaucoma and Sturge Weber, it's uh, more similar to um, like a outflow mechanism of uh, uh, like a low flow uh, fi uh, AB fistula or dural sinus fistula. Um, so it's like an increased episcleral venous pressure in um, in the more adult population, but newborns are like congenital glaucoma. Um, systemic findings, they get nevus flamius or skin angioma. These, they have a pretty um, characteristic look. They get meningeal uh, he hemangiomas. They have seizures, normal or mental retardation, hemiparesis. I think there's something with the uh, phacomatosis that the ones that include S's uh, get seizures is like another way to try and remember if you're trying to figure out what's what and you don't know what's going on, you can try and cheat sometimes. So. Um, imaging, they get cerebral calcification. Um, and here's an example of the tomato ketchup fundus, although that's not really a great picture. But they both look like they have tomato ketchup fundus to me. Um, <coughs> diffuse choroidal hemangioma, here's a um, pathology picture. Um, and if they have a circumscribed choroidal hemangioma, it is not associated with Sturge Weber, but the diffuse pattern is. And this is a more circumscribed. Um, you can see a more focal, um, kind of reddish orange. And there's an FA pattern. High internal reflectivity is characteristic on B scan. Um, and let's see. It's another, it, they can be sort of hard to see, I think, on pictures. I, don't, I haven't seen it show up on tests, but you can see it right there. Here's the outline of it. Um, retinal cavernous hemangioma. Um, it gets confusing because you can have choroidal hemangiomas and retinal hemangiomas, and you can have capillary hemangioma, which we just learned is associated with von hippel lindau and you can have cavernous hemangioma, which is right here, and it looks like a cluster of grapes. And um, I've definitely had this question on, on OCAPs and on uh, opto questions before. They will throw in one of these vascular uh, tumors of the retina. So, um, and you can kind of see the pattern that you see on FA of the two is quite different. So it should be easy to differentiate them. It's almost easier to just remember one and not the other, but um, this is like a cluster of grapes. It doesn't leak. It fills partially. Similar FA findings here. So hopefully just once you've seen, you know, enough of it, you can kind of recognize the difference between the two. Wyburn-Mason syndrome is uh, the other name for racemose angiomatosis. Um, and it's uh, a retinal and midbrain AVMs uh, on the same side. It's sporadic. They also get seizures, uh, mental changes, hemiparesis. They get intracranial calcifications. Um, these are pretty characteristic. I've also seen OCAP questions about this syndrome before and its inheritance. Um, they get rapid filling, don't typically get leakage. They can get vein inclusions or other vascular events. There's no treatment that's typically necessary unless they become symptomatic. Um, anyone know what that is? Bloch, Bloch Sol Solberg syndrome. Again, it's just another weird name for uh, incontinentia pigmenti, which is a super rare disease. Um, it's X-linked, but female only. Um, so when you see a disease that's X-linked and female only, what does it mean? It means it's 
X-linked dominant, so it's, and therefore it's lethal in males. So you won't see it in males. The only way that you could see it in males is Klinefelter syndrome, if they have an XXY. So there are very few X-linked dominant diseases that we have to remember. So put them in a in a little category and just try and remember that you won't see them in males, but they're still X-linked. Um, they get hyperpigmented macules and a splash paint distribution on the trunk. Um, they get seizures, mental retardation, dental abnormalities. Um, they get a very ROP-like um, uh, peripheral vasculopathy. And then they also can have microophthalmos, cataract, glaucoma, strabismus, and nystagmus. Um, and these are some of the findings that you'll see in IP. Um, and you can see that the fundus looks very, very uh, sick. Very, uh, there's like traptional tissue there already, and scar tissue. So, um, and this is just showing more vascular and kind of tractional issues. Um, so this is a nice little summary slide. Okay, retinoschisis. What layer does it split at? They love this question on optical questions. I can't remember seeing it on OCAPS a lot, but um, so juvenile splits at the NFL, and then adults. Well, I think I think they should cover it too. Uh, the macula is involved, and they have microcysts and little radiating folds. It's not projecting super well, but you can see the little kind of radiations coming off of that area. That's very classic for what it looks like on the exam. Um, it's non-leaking CME. They get vitreous hemorrhage um, from vitreous veils, and they can have an, a normal A wave and attenuated B wave on ERG. So it's it goes into your, um, there's, you know, there's a set of like five or six diseases that can cause negative ERG. So there, this falls in with that. Um, an adult retinoschisis uh, splits at OPL, which I remember by its like old people layer or something whenever I think of this disease. Um, but they differentiated into typical and reticular, and reticular is like juvenile. So juvenile splits at nerve fiber layer and typical splits at the old people layer. So common location, is infratemporal, um, scotoma, they have an absolute, and you get a relative scotoma with RD. Um, the reason why that happens is because uh, in, in a schesis, you, have, you are m missing the connections between the photoreceptors and the ganglion cells reaching the nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell layer being able to transmit the information. In a retinal detachment, you have um, all of the layers up, but they're still together, so they're able to transmit at least something, which also should make sense then for why you get laser uptake in retinoschisis and why you don't get laser uptake in a uh, retinal in a in a retinal detachment, uh, because you still have some retinal tissue down in schisis to be able to uptake laser. Um, so if you think if you can remember those two things, then you don't have to get yourself confused when you're trying to remember this for the test. Um, okay, these are more pictures of juvenile X-linked retinoschisis, and this is a nice path picture. Bullseye maculopathy, differential, Stargardt's cone dystrophy, chloroquine toxicity, which is treatment for malaria and RA. AMD, chronic macular hole. I mean, I would also include hydroxychloroquine on there. Um, most common primary intraocular malignancy in children, retinoblastoma. Um, it's, this is just something you have to memorize or the, um, kind of have the breakdown of retinoblastoma. Um, usually less than three years old, with leukocoria or strabismus are the most common presentations. Um, uh, 
Uh, chromosome 13 is the inherited autosomal recessive version on chromosome, uh, sorry, tumor, uh, for the tumor suppressor gene, the bar B. Um, one third are bilateral, two thirds are unilateral, and one third are hereditary, and two thirds are sporadic. And calcium is seen on ultrasound or CT. Uh, a trilateral retinal blastoma uh, would include a bilateral uh, intraocular tumor with a pineal gland involvement as well. Um, tumor grows around blood vessels, um, and you get Flexner, Wintersteiner uh, rosettes, and they're specific for uh, retinoblastoma, and they're uh, giving retinal differentiation. You can see the Flexner, Wintersteiner rosettes here. Um, and then Homer Wright rosettes are seen in uh, neuroblastoma as well, so they're not specific for RB. Um, so that's just a little minutia you have to remember, but they look a little different. They're still kind of in that ring pattern. Um, and then florets have photoreceptor differentiation. Um, prognosis is good with early treatment. Um, Enucleation, radiation, chemo, typically now it's intra-arterial chemotherapy. Um, cryolaser, spontaneous regression is rare, and they often get secondary malignancies. They like to ask about what those common malignancies are. Um, so osteosarcoma, basically sarcoma is gonna be a common secondary malignancy. And they also get melanoma. So there's a, an opto question where they ask you basically to differentiate between what are the most common uh, malignancies in the radiation field, in the field of radiation from retinoblastoma and out of the field of radiation. Um, and so the sarcomas are overall the most common um, within the radiation field and the overall most common total is gonna be uh, sarcoma plus, uh, or osteosarcoma plus uh, melanoma. So I would just try and remember that melanoma sneaks in there because it's uh, common and not inside the field of radiation. Like, like what kind of melanoma? Like skin melanoma or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Coast disease, eyes with active, uh, a massive subretinal exudates, um, and yeah, usually it's uh, one eye involvement. Males are much more common. Um, often presenting less than 10 years, but there can be a bimodal presentation. Um, they get retinal vascular uh, abnormalities, massive exudation, the uh, posterior pole. It definitely looks like RB in some cases, so you differentiate those two based on B scan. They're looking for calcification. Um, if you see calcification, it's RB. If not, you can consider coats. Um, FA is pretty characteristic in coats. Um, you see these little, like, bulbar, yeah, uh, telendectasia, little bulbs, venous beading, non-perfusion. Um, uh, on the path, you'll see loss of vascular endothelium and parasites. Um, and genetics, I don't think is completely, I don't think you'll be asked about genetics for codes. Um, if the retina is attached, laser, and, con and continue to laser, continue to laser, continue to laser. Um, also, we'll do cryo sometimes in coats, and if they're detached, um, pretty typical, cert, uh, you know, posterior segment surgeries. Um, there's a nice picture of the little kind of tiny saccular aneurysms in coats, and then the massive exudation that you get. And you can definitely have exudative RD. Like we saw a patient in clinic who looked very similar like this picture with a massive whitish thing with vessels behind their lens, it ended up being RB. So you, it, Coates versus RB is, is a definitely a real thing that you have to differentiate and the treatment is obviously quite different if they look like this. So um, there's the terminal bulbs that you see on FA. Those are really good FA examples. Medullo epithelioma is one of my favorite tumors uh, because it can form cartilage, and I think anything that can form cartilage is cool. Um, it's also called dictyoma, and 
uh, so remember that weird name. Um, it's a congenital, you know, you can, you can get it later, so I don't know that I would call it congenital always, but ciliary body uh, epithelium, but it can also form on the retina and optic nerve. Um, they get it's ribbon-like cells. Um, there, you can also see rosettes, so that you can see right there that these are kind of similar appearing um, to the uh, rosettes that you see in retinoblastoma, and uh, they secrete mucin and primary vitreous, um, and can form multiple different kinds of tissue, like uh, like I was mentioning before. So, um, treatment is in nucleation. You don't want to go into these eyes, and uh, you can cause uh, further spread of the tumor. So, um, and they may need radiation and chemo. Um, most common intraocular tumor in adult is, uh, or malignant tumor in adult is a MET. Um, most commonly from, in women, it's going to be breast, in men, lung. Um, they usually get uh, a dome growth pattern um, as opposed to the collar button or mushroom shape in mel melanoma. Um, and choroidal melanoma is next. Risk factors, ocular uh, melanosis, and uh, nevus of Oda. Um, I think the risk for choroidal melanoma, they asked this like ad nauseum, is one in uh, 400, yeah. One in 400, and then the risk for glaucoma in the melanosis, ocular melanosis, is uh, 10%. It's higher? 80? No. Don't, then don't quote me. Maybe it's 40%? I don't know. It's, they, they like to ask it. It's more. One in 400 for choroidal melanoma. So they have to be screened annually, lifetime, uh, when they have ocular melanosis. And then the difference between ocular melanosis and nevus of Oda is skin involvement. So skin involvement happens in nevus of Oda where they have the bluish discoloration of their skin and the slate gray bluish discoloration of the sclera. Um, and there's, there can be a sentinel vessel in chordal melanoma, um, and that can be a sign of ciliary body melanoma, but you won't see a sentinel vessel in every case of um, ocular melanoma. Um, size, extraocular extension, and cell type are factors predicting survival. Um, there's spindle cell, uh, spindle A, and uh, spindle cell has the best prognosis, um, and 25% 15-year mortality. Um, and epithelioid melanoma has the worst prognosis, and they have these epithelioid cells, um, and it's 75% 15-year mortality. And then you can have a mixed picture between both of them. So they may, they may show you a path. They may give you something like, say, that we have a specimen of a tumor in an eye that stains positive for HMB45, which is the typical stain that they'll throw out for melanoma. And then they'll show you four different path pictures and say which one of these has the best prognosis. Look for the one that's forming these spindle, um, the spindle formation as opposed to the epithelioid. Um, there's enough spindle you know, associated pathology that hopefully you can pick out the one and just remember spindle. Uh, and hopefully pick up the one that has the spindles on it. Um, You're and right, 10 percent. 10 percent, okay. 10, so 40, one in 400 and 10 percent. And they love to ask that. That shows up on opto questions like a million times, which is sad that I can't remember <coughs> it. Um, so when it breaks through brooks, it makes that mushroom, that classic mushroom formation. Um, and you can have, if you're gonna, you can get glaucoma from multiple mechanisms, but the most common way is direct invasion um, uh, from liberation of melanin, so or, or direct tumor invasion, basically. Um, and ultrasound actually shows low to medium internal reflectivity, and it metastasizes to the liver. And they love to differentiate between the met, met, metastatic pattern of intraocular lymphoma versus conjunctival lymphoma, which goes uh, to the lymph nodes uh, and like head and neck. 
So this goes to liver, just don't get tripped up on that. Inside the eye goes to liver and, and then on the periocular surface goes to lymph node. Um, melanoma and monosomy three is, I'm not actually sure to be honest with you about that. Um, melanocytoma is jet black. Uh, it's of the optic nerve or retina. They ha can or have visual field loss in the area. Um, path shows large polyhedral cells, small nuclei, and uh, cytoplasm filled with melanin granules. Um, this is a choroidal osteoma. Um, they can mimic a uh, amelanotic choroidal melanoma. They are peripapillary or macula. You want to get a B scan. And they have uh, on B scan, you see this highly reflect reflective um, lesion with loss of the normal orbital echoes behind the lesion. And you'll notice it's not like a massive dome shape or because what else gives you a, a really high internal reflectivity on a B scan is gonna be a choroidal hemangioma. Um, so those are going to be more of a mass than these. These are typically more flat and you lose the ultrasound waves behind it. Um, very common to develop uh, CNV, subretinal neovascularization. Um, and they can slowly enlarge in years, and if the macula is involved, the vision will be decreased. But these are pretty hard to treat. Um, this is another choroidal osteoma, and there's PATH. So. Um, and ophthalmitis, EVS is pretty high yield for life and for the test. But EVS is an old study. Um, so people often wish that we had a newer version of EVS. But, um, 420 patients after cataract surgery, initial vision of hand motion or better, no difference between tap and inject or vitrectomy and injection. Initial vision of LP or NLP um, when uh, were proven to have a benefit to go uh, straight to vitrectomy. Um, and uh, they, they achieved basically better vision loss. Uh, or be better vision outcomes, as I meant to say. Um, you have to have a clear cornea to go. Um, sometimes people think, uh, people say that uh, bleb associated in ophthalmitis is kind of in its own category and, and responds better to vitrectomy. I don't actually know what the board answer is that they want for bleb associated. I would personally answer early vitrectomy. So. Um, and um, I would just read, they, there's always, I feel like there's always a question, there are always multiple questions about an ophthalmitis on OCAP, so I would read this study and maybe it's abstract once over before the test. Um, not, not the full study, just read it's abstract, it's fine, or it's main findings. Um, I've, heard, I've seen them ask, at least on opto questions, about the antibiotics that were used. And I don't want to state it wrong, but I think it was vancomycin and... Uh, acephalosporin, but I'm not, don't quote me on that right now. We can look it up later. All right. And they also love to ask about the most common organisms in endophthalmitis. I think that might be in this presentation later. Um, ERG, EOG, and VEP. There's usually not too many questions on this topic on OCAPs. And maybe I've seen one each year. Uh, mainly usually about an ERG, and it's more just involving inter kind of interpreting an ERG within a picture of a patient. But um, an ERG measures uh, mass retina. Uh, the A wave is photoreceptors, B wave is Mueller and bipolar cells, and C uh, is RPE. Amplitude is the entire retina response. Oscillatory potential is the interplexiform layer, and ganglion cells are not measured. Pattern ERG measures ganglion cells, and ERG is an indirect measure of voltage between the inner and outer uh, retina. Um, and uh, if you have a normal EOG, you know you have a normal RP and sensory retina, but it's, it doesn't, honestly, ERG is not very useful outside of ruling in or out best disease. I don't really see it used otherwise. Um, visual volt potentials are, uh, anywhere, defect anywhere in the visual system and 
used best in preverbal infants, and it can be used to give an estimation of visual acuity in a preverbal infant. But they have to be able, to, they have to uh, be able to pay attention. Uh, uh, so you can't do it to a severe, do a BEP in a severely direct, like uh, mentally disabled uh, uh, preverbal infant. So, um, if if you have a normal EOG, normal ERG, and abnormal EOG. Um, it can be basically chloroquine toxicity, pattern dystrophy, or best disease in its carriers, and you would see those in very different patient populations. So, and then in best disease, you have the Arden ratio, which I think is greater than 1.6 is normal, and best disease is less than 1.4, and that's just a random number that has nothing to do with anything, but you have to be able to at least recognize, have it somewhere in the back of your mind, the Arden ratio is, uh, cut, it, that, that is the result of the ERG. Um, and an abnormal ERG but normal EOG you might see in congenital stationary night blindness or X-linked retinoschisis. Um, angioid streaks, the mnemonic Pepsi, Pagets, Ehlers-Danlos, Pseudodanthum elasticum, sickle cell, idiopathic that gives you your Pepsi. Um, differential for vitreous opacities, um, asteroid hyalosis which are calcium soaps, um, synchesis scintillans, which are uh, cholesterol crystals after vitreous hemorrhage. I always think that one's really hard to remember um, because you would think it's just dehemoglobinized team, but it's actually cholesterol crystals. So. Um, amyloid, and that's going to be associated with um, other systemic disease. And I would also include lymphoma on there uh, and posterior uh, uh, uveitis, but um, intraocular heme, Tursan syndrome, um, which gives you a subarachnoid and subdural hemorrhage, and then Percher's retinopathy, which is mostly parapopillary, and uh, you can have it in trauma or a compressive trunk injury, but um, you can also have Percher's like retinopathy from many other conditions like acute pancreatitis, lupus, ambiotic, amniotic fluid embolism, fat embolism, renal failure, and retrobulbar anesthesia. I try and, like, I, those two syndromes are confusing to me to remember, so I try and remember Percher's sounds like pushing, so you use, like, crush injury or chest compressions. Um, and then Tursans, I always remember, is the other one. Uh, but they both can kind of present in the acute trauma setting, so Tursans is going to be from your brain bleeds. Shaken baby syndrome. Um, 85% have retinal hemorrhages, mostly in the posterior pole, vitreous hemorrhage, retinoschisis, um, retinal folds, and birth trauma heme really persists more than one month. If you're given a question about a newborn who has that fundus or, or a mild retinal hemorrhage fundus appearance, it's most likely related to the trauma of birth and maybe platelet, platelet abnormalities at birth rather than shaken baby syndrome. But, um, so. You know, it's always difficult to say, but they if they give you a shaken baby case on OCAPS, they will give you some history. So, um, especially if they give you like an enucleated eye, you know, if they give you no history and an enucleated eye, you know it's shaken baby syndrome, um, or you're pretty sure it is if they if it has classic findings, um, because otherwise their child never would have gone to autopsy. So, um, other things to consider: X-linked retinoschisis. Pars planitis, child abuse, um, blood dyscrasias, I would include on there. Salt and pepper fundus, rubella retinopathy, Leber's congenital amaurosis, congenital syphilis, um, carriers of albinism, choroideremia, and RP, and uh, uh, CPEO, um, which is chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. Um, and differential for bullseye maculopathy, we already had this, sorry. Uh, cherry red spot differential, sphingolipidoses, Tay-Sachs, Sandhoff, Neiman-Pick, Gaucher's, Faber, uh, Farber's disease, CRAO definitely, OIS more rarely, trauma, mainly commotio is going to be your, um, you know, a major confusion between a CRAO and uh, uh, and com and 
uh, did they have Ciario or Comoscio? A uh, OCT can help you to differentiate between those two or an FA. Um, and then uh, quinine and methanol toxicity, toxicity um, and uh, SSPE. Does anyone remember what SSPE is? Subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. It's seen um, years and years after mumps infection, and it's uh, a terminal condition, um, and it's associated with a cherry red spot. Um, and usually, if they're going to give you that question, which I've never seen before um, about SSPE, they'll give you a scenario with an unvaccinated child who is having neurologic changes at an adult age and vision changes. And then a, maybe a cherry red spot. So have it in the back of your head. Okay, albinism. And there's two. I think they, they do, I have seen questions on this before, and I think they test it because they're potentially lethal. So they want, they, they want you to recognize things that are potentially lethal and be able to make the correct referral. So, Chidiak Higashi, uh, which uh, they get recurrent infections and hermansky pudlak syndrome. They get bleeding diatheses, so. Um, and then they also have albinism as well, so you have to refer these kids for a full evaluation. Okay, vitro retinal degenerations. Uh, Main one that you need to worry about is sticklers. They get optically empty vitreous. They get optic atrophy, um, severe myopia, increased risk of RD, and extremely hard to fix RDs. Glaucoma, they have a marfanoid habitus, Pierre Robin uh, sequence, hearing loss, metro valve prolapse. They get a decreased B wave on ERG, and it's a defect in type 2 collagen. And uh, Wagner syndrome is autosomal dominant and they don't have a risk of RD. Um, they can have an abnormal ERG. I wouldn't worry too much about Wagner syndrome. It's even hard to find information on Wagner's on like, the internet, so I don't know why they test. They, they always ask about it on, uh, in like opto questions, but I don't think it's high yield. Um, it, and they don't have a risk of RD, so. Um, depositions. Copper, um, you get into decimase membrane and the lens capsule. Um, if you have, so you think about copper deposition and decimase membrane from systemic disease. Does anyone remember that one? Yeah, Wilson's disease. And it's called the, remember what it's called? Sorry? No, sorry. Oh, yeah, that's right. Hepatolenticular degeneration is right. But no, do you remember what the ring is called? Yeah. And then the lens capsule copper deposition, I think you can also see in Wilson's, but uh, you might think of that more clinically from the retina perspective uh, in someone who has an intraocular form body that's copper. So um, they, they can get in the can lens capsule or the endothelium as well. Um, and uh, that can help you to know if someone's presenting with like a chronic IOFB, what it might be containing of iron, uh, deposits in the epithelium, uh, mercury deposits in the lens capsule. Uh, these are just things, uh, I don't think this is super high yield to go over um, right now. I think you all probably by now know the 4-2-1 rule of um, four quadrants of diffuse intraretinal heme and microaneurysms, um, two quadrants of venous beating, or one quadrant of IRMA, and that is the definition of severe NPDR, and then very severe is greater than two um, of those. Uh, CSME is CME within 500 microns of the phobia, hard exudates within 500 microns of the phobia with adjacent CME, or edema, one disc area within one disc diameter of the phobia. I think those are really hard to remember, but if you stare at them enough times. Uh, PDR is a quarter to a third disc area of NVD, or any NVD with vitreous hemorrhage, or a half disc area of NVE with vitreous hemorrhage. Clinically, many times, always see as the vitreous hemorrhage, and you can't identify the neo. So. Um, 
These are good, just like single liners about the diabetes studies. I'm, I don't think I need to read this out loud, but I'll let you guys just kind of digest it for a second. Um, If you guys want copies of these slides, I'm happy to share them with you because it's these lectures I always felt like were so fast that you just don't really have time to digest too much. But and then these are the um, diabetes studies. I'll be honest, I, they don't often ask about studies on OCAPs. I, I can bear, I can remember very few, and all the years I've taken OCAPs, I have not studied and memorized the different studies. I think they're more likely to ask. Maybe something from like a very old classic study that's still relevant today, like ETDRS, and then more likely to ask you about the like big glaucoma studies. And maybe I've had a question about like um, AGS or normal tension glaucoma from, based on one of those based on one of the studies. So, but uh, I really haven't seen them ask about these uh, the diabetic studies. AMD, small drusen classified as less than 64 microns, large is greater than 125, um, and worst prognosis if they're large, soft, pigmented, densely packed with drusen, drusen with PED. Um, categories, uh, you know, category one being very, very mild, less than five small drusen, mild, uh, one medium drusen, pigment changes, multiple small drusen, intermediate, greater than one large drusen, non-central GA or extensive medium drusen, and uh, four being severe GA or wet ARMD, and uh, vision is uh, very poor. Um, and I don't think they meant, we meant to write 32, sorry. Um, <laughs> AREDs, uh, I would look up the doses every once in a while. I think that pops up of the, or they, the, the, uh, I would sorry not look up. I would memorize the dose, dosing of each one of those if you can, um, and then AREDS two added ten milligrams of lutein, zeaxanthine, and omega three. Uh, they took away beta carotene and they decreased zinc, and they basically showed that the new revised um, version was uh, you know equally effective, and so they were they showed that that's safe to do. So they AREDS two is pretty much the standard of care now. Uh, AMD studies, uh, I think, are at this point low yield. They're just historical. And, um, injection studies, the same. Um, I, I just have never seen them ask about it. I wouldn't spend too much time on it personally. Uh, if you want a 99 percentile, go for it. Um, I, just, I still don't know if it would be high yield for you. And then these are some of the um, vein occlusion studies. Um, basically just, you know, kind of taking you through the history, justifying first laser, and then next uh, identifying the use of anti-VEGF. So um, one of the takeaways from um, the vein occlusion studies is that it, you don't do PRP unless they develop NEO. Um, that's the end. Yeah. Um, so I had a couple. Let me see. I had a couple of just like notes of things. That I think are high yield. Um, you can see a negative ERG um, in CRVO, CRAO, X linked retinoschisis, melanoma associated retinopathy, and CSNV. Um, there's a pretty short list of entities that cause a negative ERG. Um, and that's where you have a normal A wave and a flat B. Um, chloroquine. 
binds the RPE. I think there have been questions about its site in uh, the eye, which causes toxicity. Uh, if you have P acnes or you suspect it, um, you want to do a tap and inject and take out. It depends. Uh, it depends what clinical scenario they give you. Typically, they're going to give you a patient who has uh, had surgery relatively remotely, um, you know, within the last couple months, who has ongoing inflammation and has some sort of a capsular opacity. They can never be tapered off of steroids. They keep flaring. Um, they have a little bit of vitreous cells. And you can do a tap and inject, but then the definitive treatment, if they don't get better with a tap and inject, is to take everything the bag, the lens, and then they, you don't re implant something right away, you would wait. So, uh, I included some uveitis stuff in here oh, that I think is high yield. Uh, again, cyclovir toxicity, uh, especially when combined with azathioprine, is very myelotoxic. Phosphornet has less miles, myelosuppression. Um, you should definitely know how uh, the different antibiotics work. Don't get too far into their mechanism, but there have been questions every single year about um, what, wh how fluoroquinolones work, how aminoglycosides work. Um, and uh, just study that. It's fast and easy, and I think it's high yield. Um, if someone develops anaphylaxis from an FA, know the dose of um, epi that you give, which is, uh, I think, 1 to 1,000 sub-Q. Um, and then uh, be able to recognize optic nerve head drusen on a B scan. Um, and we already looked at a B scan of an osteoma. Um, anyone know what idiopathic sclerochoroidal calcification looks like and where it forms? It was like a rare thing. Um, it's kind of like scleral plaques, where it just uh, basically age-related changes, but they can look like tumors, and they typically form like in the kind of the like right off the arcade, and kind of hypopigmented. If you guys have never seen it before, just look up a picture, or I can sh I can just pull one up in the end, or I'll just do it now because I'll probably forget. Um, and tell me when it's time to leave, and I'll stop. Uh, here's a picture of idiopathic sclerochoroidal calcification. It's pretty striking, right? These are both good. This is a good example. You see that and you're like, whoa, is that like a amelanotic melanoma? So you're going to do your typical workup, but if you find nothing, then you can call it idiopathic sclerochoroidal calcification. Uh, okay. Ghost cell... Glaucoma, you can get it after vitreous hemorrhage. Um, we already talked about the FA of a retinal cavernous hemangioma. Um, JRA in a kid, they always ask a question about JRA, like multiple questions about JRA. Um, so it, I think it's a high yield topic to study. Basically, I think the way to break it down is every three months, Visits for posse articular, ANA positive, RF negative. Those are the highest risk girls. Uh, and then everyone else pretty much is every 6 to 12 months, and the standard of care is going to be methotrexate. Know why you need to give folanic acid in toxo treatment. Um, most common organism after a TRAB for endophthalmitis maybe is H flu, so opto question says differently. I would know that H flu, rather than, this is the way I would remember this, H flu is present in, uh, in post-trab, or BRE, but blebrated and ophthalmitis, and it's not a present, it's not a common culprit, or as common of a culprit in run-of-the-mill post-op and ophthalmitis. So just remember, if, you, if you're seeing, if H flu is on the list for you after a TRAB for mo the common organisms for endophthalmitis, I would go with that one. They get really tricky in optical questions, and they give like two different combinations of um, bacteria after uh, TRAB. So um, if it's, you know, some of this minutia is so hard to remember. But, um, but mainly everything else, uh, coag, uh, coag negative staph, 
um, is going to be common, and strep is also common after um, strep is also common after a trab. Um, if you see someone who has an adult with NLDO and a URI, um, they don't always give you all the information. So put those things together and link them in your brain for that being uh, like Wagner's. Okay. Uh, I don't know why I included this one in here. Vitamin A, you get goblet, goblet cell dysfunction. I guess I included that because uh, sometimes they'll give you a, um, a scenario where a patient is presenting with night blindness and they have no retinal changes. They may have some ERG changes and some visual field changes. And they may ask you what the sequelae are of this disease and you have to, and, or they may show you a BTO spot. Um, so that I'm just trying to point out some of the, of the minutia that they like to ask about vitamin A deficiency. Um, gyrate atrophy, I always have trouble remembering gyrate atrophy versus uh, choroideremia. Um, so choroideremia is X-linked and gyrate atrophy is OAT gene. And uh, so the history is gonna be different between the two of them that you'll get. And then gyroid atrophy requires vitamin supplementation. Um, and they, and uh, you, it's also diagnosed with a um, plasma ornithine level. Uh, if you see somebody who has, presents with acute bilateral CRVOs, you definitely should think of a blood dyscrasia, like Waldenstrom's macular globe anemia would be the classic presentation. You could also think of um, my, multiple myeloma in the same category. If you have somebody presenting with erythema nodosum, think about sarcoid and TB. This is just one random uveitis one that I've seen, uh, this keratoderma blenaragicum, which is a uh, uh, strange looking foot uh, lesions. I don't know if you guys have seen it before. Keratoderma blenaragicum. Oh yeah, it looks just like that. It's very characteristic looking. They might give you a picture of that, and that's associated with reactive arthritis. Uh, if you see, I should have talked a little more about PHPV. It's just not enough time to cover everything. I apologize. Yeah, again. Erythema nodosum. Oh, okay. PHPV uh, association also with microphthalmos and microcornea. So you see a kid in clinic, they have uh, leukocoria of some sort, your differential being the same things we talked about, coats, retinoblastoma, PHPV is in there. Um, you definitely, if they're microphthalmic and have a microcornea, then think about PHPV as well. So that these are little ways that can tip you one way or another on a test. Uh, vitreous detachment, they um, sometimes will ask about what in the vitreous, what, air, what part of the vitreous is responsible for the detachment. It's the cortical vitreous detaching from the internal limiting membrane. Uh, I kept this in here because pilocarpine increases uveal scleral outflow, but it also increases your rate of RD formation and it can worsen CME and uveitis. So, uh, infliximab, uh, no, just try and know some of the mechanisms of actions of some of the biologic agents. The infliximab being TNF alpha. I have two agents on here that can cause hypopions. I would know those cold. They like to ask about that. Uh, rifabutin, and then I think the other one is sidofovir at the end. Yeah, sidofovir. Uh, I think I'm out of time. I'll let you guys go. But uh, is there anything like super high yield in here? Commotio uh, on path, you'll see photoreceptor dysfunction. Uh, remember, TAS presents 24 hours. It looks like endophthalmitis, but it's going to be on post up day one. Um, I would definitely know the clock hours. Uh, I would know the, e the ETROP definitions for the test. There's always one or two ROP questions on every single OCAP. Um, apparently there was something about fundus, fundus alba punctatus, um, which is a very characteristic looking, 
hereditary. Um, they're just ones that I think have been high yield over the years that I've taken notes on to like make a quick note to like study before the test. Um, so this is what Fundus Alba Punctatus looks like. It's really it's really odd looking. The I think the only thing you could confuse it with is star darts. Um, and they can see the macula looks pretty normal. I didn't make a slide on it, but look it up at home. Um, I think we're pretty much good. And that's, uh, yeah. Oh, this is another one. Every year there's going to be something. It's like literally every year on the OCAPs about which one of these little peripheral retinal lesions makes you have an increased risk for an RD. So mainly meridional folds, um, I think uh, enclosed oral bay, um, and uh, of course lattice. So, um, but I would just, that's like minutia to look up before the test, and it's high yield because there will be a question on it. So. Sorry, what's the other one? Oh, rifibutin. They, I've, I think I've seen a question too before where they ask you to differentiate between or to to know um, the difference between the risk factors for CRVO and BRVO, mm -hmm. and I can never remember it by uh, memory. But it's like uh, there's obesity, diabetes, and hypertension are risk factors, and CRVO has two and BRVO has two and they don't overlap. It's like one of them was taken out. I, I, I don't know why, but they've tested on it before um, as far as the risk factors for us. So I would look that up too. Thank you. You're welcome.